Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about copyrights, which is another form of intellectual property, just like patents are a form of intellectual property. And by intellectual property, I mean, it's not something physical, not a real piece of property. It's an idea or it's a concept. It's not like a car or a house. Instead, it's something like an intellectual creation. In fact, early on in copyright law in the US, uh, that was pretty much put into practice where somebody bought the copper plate, a piece of you know, copper that a printer used to make a map and felt he had the right to make the map because he had bought the plate. And they said, no, no, the map, the concept of the map, the whole you know, creation of the map is copyrighted just because you own a physical printer's plate doesn't mean you get to copy it. The difference between patents and copyrights is generally patents tend to uh, cover inventions or discoveries, and copyrights tend to cover creative works, like a book or a piece of music or a poem that you write, something that can be copied and sold. And so if you write a book, you can license the copyright or use the copyright, to have many, many copies made. And out of those, you have a right to the royalties that come from those copies. Uh, the, uh, my, my daughter sometimes was against copyrights. It's like, okay, it, why don't you just share everything you do freely? I mean, it was like Napster. We're sharing all the music for a while for free, peer-to-peer -peer sharing. And I, you know, explain that uh, everything I've done in life has been basically copyrights, whether I was at Time Magazine, we were making a magazine, or writing books. And uh, if I want to pay my mortgage or to pay my daughter's bills to college, I have to have a right to make something when people copy other things I produce. It goes back to something called the Statute of Anne. The Statute of Anne was uh, created in uh, 1710 in England, uh, right about the time that Ben Franklin and John Peter Zanger were coming over here and creating print shops. And it said that basically what was happening is that people were printing, reprinting, and publishing uh, the works of uh, authors without their consent, without giving them any uh, money for it. And therefore, we're going to have a law that in the future, uh, means that you can't do that unless the author gives you permission and that usually requires paying a copyright fee to the author. And that will be for the encouragement of learned men to compose uh, and write useful books. Uh, both copyrights and patents are part of the uh, Constitution, Article One of the Constitution says to promote the progress of science and the useful arts, you get to secure for limited times to authors and inventors the right to their writings and discoveries. Uh, so the, the copyright law that I want to discuss now involves something that's a copyright, but also kind of close to a patent. In fact, the court said it was like a patent. And that was the copyright to the graphical user interface on computers. Now, many, many years ago, like 40 years ago, back when Steve Jobs was young and Bill Gates was young and I was young, this is what a computer screen looked like. This was called a, at first there was the C prompt uh, and it's what you had when you logged on to your computer and it was a command line. And uh, the command line was the user interface you had on a computer. As you can see, it's not very user friendly. It's not intuitive. You had to figure out how do I, you know, change things on a command line. So what happens is uh, at Xerox Park in the 1970s, there is, there are a group of people trying to make things simpler. Xerox Park was a Palo Alto Research Center of the Xerox Corporation, which is based on the East Coast, but it had a research center out in Silicon Valley. Uh, 
because it wanted to have that inventiveness and innovative spirit there. And there was a guy named Alan Kay who wanted to make a computer that was simple enough for kids to use, or as he put it, kids of all ages. Because up until then, with all those command lines and things I showed you a moment ago, computers weren't something that were easy or intuitive to use. And his boss has kept saying, well, you know, you have to predict whether people will want this in the future. You know, do we have any predictions or models about what the future will mean in terms of ordinary people and kids wanting to use computers? And Alan Kay uttered a great line, which was the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So he invented at Xerox Park what we call the GUI, which stands for graphical user interface. And it's what's on your computer right now and on your iPhone. And whether you have an Apple or a PC, you're using a graphical user interface. It's not like that god awful command line thing. It's, and this is one of the first of them, this was Xerox's first creation for the graphical user interface in the 1970s. And like our computers today, it sort of had windows and you point and you clicked and it had drop down menus. And one day, Steve Jobs goes to Xerox Park because he had somebody who worked with him at Apple named Jeff Raskin. And Jeff Raskin had said, this is the future of computers. I have friends at Xerox Park. We have to uh, do the graphical user interface. And Steve Jobs was not a fan of Jeff Raskin, even though they both worked together, the company that Steve founded, Apple. In fact, Steve had a technical term for Jeff. He referred to him all the time as the shithead who sucks. Despite that, Steve knew how to listen to people. And he finally goes out to Xerox Park and he's blown away by this graphical user interface that he sees. Realizes this will be the future of computers and what he does is he offers Xerox the right to invest a million dollars in Apple if they'll, as he put it, open up the kimono, you know, show all the stuff behind the scenes, how they made that graphical user interface. Indeed, that's what Xerox does. It makes an investment in Apple, licenses some of the rights to some of the graphics that they've developed. Later on, Steve liked to almost brag because he believed it was that the Macintosh division that he had created was like a pirate ship and they were pirates. So he liked to brag that they stole this from Xerox, kind of forgetting that they had made this deal for Xerox to license it based on an investment. And one of uh, Steve Jobs' lines was he would uh, quote Picasso who said, good artist copy, great artist steal. And as Steve Jobs said, We've always been a bit shameless about stealing ideas, which you would think would not be a good thing to say if you're going to enter into a copyright case in which you're trying to prevent people from stealing what you call your ideas. In fact, when this copyright case happens, they fling back at him, the people against him, uh, that quote saying, we've always been shameless about stealing great ideas. So what they end up doing is creating the Macintosh system software that, like the Xerox one, was based on easy to use graphics. You pointed and you clicked at a trash can if you wanted to throw something away, or you pointed at an empty folder, or you, uh, and the windows, they were nice, they overlapped on each other. And so it became a simple, easy way to use a computer and basically Apple introduces it in a computer that is not very popular called the Lisa, very expensive computer in 1983, but much more famously, Steve Jobs' favorite computer that he developed, the Macintosh in 1984. Now what happens of course is that Microsoft run by Bill Gates does a whole lot of the software that's used on Apple computers. So Steve Jobs had to show him the new user interface, in fact, give him all the technical specifications of it so that Microsoft could do Microsoft Word and spreadsheets and Outlook and all those things and have it work with the new interface on Apple computers. And Steve was always worried that uh, Microsoft would then just steal the design. And they made some deals which were 
you know, you can use some of what's in this. It's a complicated, it was all a matter of a court dispute later, but they license many of the elements of uh, Apple, uh, Apple's graphical user interface. And indeed, Microsoft does come out with its own graphical user interface uh, that is quite similar, as you can see, to Apple's. It has Windows, in fact, they name it Windows, and the windows overlap on each other and you point and click and it has trash cans and everything else. Well, Steve Jobs, even though he had made a bit of a deal uh, with Bill Gates in order to uh, have Bill Gates and Microsoft continue to write programs for the Apple computer, he made a bit of a deal with him that he could use some of the graphical interfaces, user interface elements. He becomes absolutely furious, of course, when it is almost totally copied. And he goes completely ballistic and says to Bill Gates, that's Bill Gates on the right, Steve Jobs on the left, when they were both young, he says they meet. He uh, summons Bill Gates down from uh, Seattle to, for a meeting at Apple headquarters. This is in the late 1980s, uh, this is actually 1984-85, when uh, Microsoft is first coming out with its windows. And at the meeting, in front of some of Bill Gates's uh, colleagues who had come down from Seattle, and in front of Steve's colleagues, Steve Jobs says, you're ripping us off, I trusted you, and now you're stealing from us. And Gates leans back, quiet. Bill Gates doesn't raise his voice the way Steve Jobs used to. And Bill Gates said, well, the way I look at it, there's another way of looking at this. I think it's more like we both had this rich uncle, rich neighbor named Xerox. And I broke into his house to steal the TV set and found that you had already stolen it. And so they end up going to court over did um, Microsoft steal too much of the graphical user interface. Well, the court decision ends up being very important. It follows in a tradition that had begun in 1840, which was there was a difference between having an idea and expressing an idea. That's true in patent law and it's true in copyright law. In other words, just by having an idea of a particular invention, like how about a light bulb and I put a filament in it, uh, you can't patent just that idea. You have to what's called reduce it to practice. In other words, you got to do it. You got to show it worked. You got to actually make it. And so that's the distinction between an idea and the expression of an idea. Likewise, in a copyright case like this one, which was about the desktop metaphors and trash cans and file folders and everything else, that's an idea which you can't copyright but you can only copyright the expression of the idea, how you actually execute it. Now, Steve Jobs said that they had executed it, you know, very, very specifically, where if you drag and move a window on your screen, it kind of overlaps. Uh, you can see how we do it nowadays. It kind of overlaps with the other window. And those type of things were part of the overall look and feel of the user interface that Apple had created. And they said, it's not just so much that there's this element like the trash can or this element like the folder and whether they were copied or not. It's that in total, the look and feel of Microsoft Windows was a ripoff of the look and feel of the Apple user interface. And indeed, the court ends up deciding with Microsoft. It ends up saying almost all the similarities between Windows and Apple interfaces spring from basic ideas and that their expressions are obvious. Just like in patent law, if you have a wooden doorknob and somebody says, well, I've invented a new one and it's a clay or porcelain do doorknob, you don't get a new patent on that, the court ruled, because that was obvious. There was an obviousness to it. And likewise, in copyright law, the court says the similarities of the spring from basic ideas like 
having a desktop metaphor, which you can't copyright. And they're obvious expression. Like if you're gonna do it, you can have a file folder or whatever. And illicit, in other words, illegal copying could only occur, could occur only if the work as a whole are virtually identical. And so Apple loses the case. Now, the upshot is these, that's in the mid 1980s. The case goes on into the 90s after Steve Jobs had been ousted from Apple, but his successors, John Scully, Gil Emilio, keep pursuing this case through appeals against Microsoft on the look and feel. And then in the late 1990s, Apple has to bring Steve Jobs back. Apple is falling on hard times. And Steve gets rehired after having been fired in 1985. In the late 1990s, 1998, he slowly starts coming back to Apple and finally made the CEO. And one of the first things he does is he asks Bill Gates to come back again from Seattle down uh, to Palo Alto to come visit Steve Jobs and they take a walk and they make a deal to settle this long running case, which Microsoft had kept winning, but Apple kept appealing, so it was still unclear. And they made a deal that basically uh, Microsoft would continue to write products for Apple, just like the old Xerox deal. Uh, he allows Microsoft to make an investment, and get stock in Apple, and they do a handshake, and Steve announces it at one of the Macworld conferences, this one in Boston. Happened to be at Time Magazine, happened to be there, and we decide, okay, we're going to put that on the cover. The great Diana Walker took this photograph before the show, before Macworld had opened, but she was there in the empty auditorium while Steve was talking on a cell phone to Bill Gates, putting the final touches on the deal so he could announce it. And he says, Bill, thank you. The world's a better place. And so it ends up getting settled, which is another thing about copyright and patent law, which is in the end, it should be like when Intel and Texas Instruments spent five or six years in a patent battle over who had invented the microchip. Finally, the head of Intel calls the head of Texas Instruments, Jack Kilby, Bob Noyce calls Jack Kilby, and they just get the lawyers out of the way. They do a handshake, they cross license. And there's an old lesson in business that sometimes the patent and copyright lawyers don't follow, which is don't keep fighting over the proceeds until you finish robbing the stagecoach. And that's a lesson we have to have, which is that intellectual property is really good. You want to defend it. That's how you end up making money. If you create something, if you write a book, if you write a piece of music, if you do a wonderful, beautiful interface on your computer, or you patent an invention. That's the way you make money. But after a while, you don't always keep fighting. You realize in the end that you should do what's best both for the consumers and for your company and not get too emotionally attached to things like copyrights and patents. So thanks, and I'll see you next time.